We stand on an invisible precipice, one which is hardly known, let alone acknowledged by most human beings, but it is there nonetheless. It's a precipice that is representative of what seems to be an inevitable rethinking and recycling of things previously thought fact and self-evident. Think of the previous millennia. Divine power was regarded by most as self-evident. It was at work in the storms that were visited upon men, in the crops that yielded fruit, and the seemingly God-driven events which condemn men to die. Disease was a curse of the gods, often cast upon man for transgressions against the divine order, or so it was thought. This can be witnessed in the burning of witches and the branding and execution of heretics for calling down divine wrath upon populations. When modern science first found its burgeonings in the 15th century, the context into which it was born remained largely theistic, and remained so for centuries to come. Kepler, Galileo, Newton, all were men of varying degrees of piety, but pious they were. The 18th century represents the slow but gradual shift from a theistic world model to one at least partially shaped and driven by a belief in man as a mover and shaker. During the Enlightenment, religion grew to be of lesser importance. But in particular, this period marks the shrinking relevance of religion for the purposes of understanding the world. One is reminded of the anecdotal quote by the 18th and 19th century French physicist and mathematician Pierre Laplace, when after completing his magnum opus, titled Celestial Mechanics, Napoleon asked him where God fits into it, whereupon he replied, Allegedly, sire, I had no need of that hypothesis. All but the least educated would today attribute a thunderstorm to an angry deity, even if the hail and rain have ruined their clothes and crops. These transitions in thinking in our perception of the world and ourselves represent paradigm shifts that eventually come to dominate how we conduct ourselves intellectually. If the previous era, which we could date from some time prior to the inception of civilization to the early modern period, was one characterized by divine agency executed both through the human hand and externally, which we might conveniently refer to as the age of gods, then the era we live in, and that has been present for a few centuries, is most likely the age of optimism. This age of optimism has been characterized by the belief in the ability of man to overcome virtually any problem by way of human virtue, however poorly defined human virtue in this context might be, the skills of reason and rationality, and perhaps, more importantly, the emotion of hope intermingled between the two, which I will return to later. It stands in stark contrast to the age of gods, because during that age, man was seen to be a hapless recipient of fate, a tool or amusement for the gods. Greek mythology, for example, is permeated with such imagery of mortals being toys of the gods. The true difference between these epochs is a shift in worldview between man's passive agency and active agency. I should point out that there are likely no precise or clear transitions between the worldviews, since the theistic worldview has continued to interfere with scientific and human advancement well into this age of optimism. Think of the Dover, Pennsylvania Intelligent Design Trial in 2005, and so further back, it's likely precedent to the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925. The desire to find divine agency in the mechanical workings of the world persists and will likely do so for a long time to come, particularly when it comes to issues of human biology. With every fundamental paradigm shift of thought, we can expect ample resistance from those who cling to an older paradigm. This acts as a hindrance, and as mentioned at the beginning of the video, we now stand at a point in which a new paradigm shift is gradually taking place. We are ever so slowly transitioning from an age of optimism to an age of realism. The span of time from one age to the next has been noticeably shorter when compared to the duration of the age of gods, and much of that has to do with the advancement of science. There has been, however, an interesting turn in events. Science has paved the way for a new understanding of the world and man, but some of the more recent discoveries have brought havoc to the models of optimism that have long dominated the stream of Western thought evolutionary theory, genetics, and even the precise understanding of the universe have all, much as waves against ancient cliffs, crashed against the long-held and cherished beliefs percolating ever so slightly, bringing about the first signs of erosion to a set of convictions hitherto assumed to be self-evident. There are, differences notwithstanding, 
similarities between the Age of Gods and the Age of Optimism. Both run on articles of faith. In the Age of Gods, power and the ability to affect change was largely attributable to external forces, allegedly divine, and man was a receiver rather than an actor. In the Age of Optimism, which is to say the present age, there is an unprecedented faith in the faculty of human reason, rationality, and man's ability to overcome challenge through some type of poorly defined free will. At the core of both articles of faith is the striking lack of explanatory mechanism to accompany the workings of said faith. In the age of gods, a successful farmer owed his success to the gods' favor, channeled through his callous hands, and a man possessed of heretical beliefs was possessed externally, rather obviously, by the devil. In the age of human optimism, a man who is incredibly fit, strong, and lean achieved this through willpower, or so it is called. Conversely, the morbidly obese man either failed to achieve the former man's results or fell victim to his cravings because of a lack of so-called willpower. Notice how in none of the above cases is there a plausible mechanism being proposed as to how these things actually come to pass. Why the crops grow and why one man is fit and the other is obese. In fact, the term God could easily be exchanged for willpower with little difference in description. So let's try that, just for the sake of experimentation. The successful farmer owes his success to his willpower. And likewise, the heretic owes his lack of faith to a lack of willpower. The fit, lean, and strong man achieves his condition through God's favor, and the obese man is such because he is possessed by the devil. When you dissect the language being used, you actually begin to appreciate that despite some outstanding differences between these thought paradigms, there is actually something lacking, and that is legitimate description. Of course, on balance, the modern age of optimism has produced some excellent descriptive models completely lacking during the age of gods. However, because it is fueled by a type of anthropocentric megalomania, its fatal flaw is that it cannot be confronted with ideas that refute the conceit of infinite human malleability. It was in the early stages of the age of optimism that the modern blank slate theory was born, primarily attributable to the political philosopher John Locke, Locke conceived of a human that began with nothing and as life progressed was fed sensory input, leading to the learning of rules. Quote, Let us then suppose the mind to have no ideas in it, to be like white paper with nothing written on it. How then does it come to be written on? From where does it get that vast store which the busy and boundless imagination of man has painted on it, all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer, in one word, from experience. Our understandings derive all the materials of thinking from observations that we make of external objects that can be perceived through the senses, and of the internal operations of our minds, which we perceive by looking in at ourselves. These two are the foundations of knowledge from which arise all the ideas we can have or can naturally have. Although modern blank slate theory differs somewhat, Locke's thoughts, coupled with strict philosophical empiricism, form the bedrock of the human optimism project, because it is believed that through external input, all things can be learnt, and by extension, the mind can be bettered, behavior improved, and so on and so forth. Much of the fundamental ideas of the Enlightenment, in particular political ideas and values, can be traced back to the optimism that was born in that age. Equality, fairness, the ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, and many of these, indeed, are noble ideals. But the question to ask is whether or not these ideas, born in a time prior to a deeper understanding of human psychology, and above all evolution, can function unfettered. To pose the question in a different way, I would ask if Enlightenment values, conceived prior to modern evolutionary theory, are actually compatible with human beings as they are, as opposed to how humans wish themselves to be. Before proceeding forward to the aforementioned considerations of the compatibility of so-called modern Enlightenment societies with the realities of human nature, I wish to briefly return to one of the examples cited previously and offer a descriptive and realism-based explanation for the purpose of demonstrating that explanation opens up the possibility of real solutions. We saw that in both the gods-based and optimism-based systems, 
the explanation of why the obese man is obese, in fact, comes down to a lack of explanation. In a realism-based model, the approach is different. Causal mechanisms are explored and lay down the groundwork for possible solutions to the respective problem, in this case, the cause of this man's obesity. So let's give it a go. One plausible mechanism that can be posited for the man might be leptin resistance. I've spoken of leptin before, but to review briefly, leptin is a hormone commonly referred to as a satiety hormone as its primary role is in regulating hunger. Quote, congenital leptin deficiency is a condition that causes severe obesity beginning in the first few months of life. Affected individuals are of normal weight at birth, but they are constantly hungry and quickly gain weight. Without treatment, the extreme hunger continues and leads to chronic excessive eating, hyperphagia, and obesity. Beginning in early childhood, affected individuals develop abnormal eating behavior, such as fighting with other children over food, hoarding food, and eating in secret. Congenital leptin deficiency is caused by mutations in the LEP gene. This gene provides instructions for making a hormone called leptin, which is involved in the regulation of body weight. Normally, the body's fat cells release leptin in proportion to their size. As fat accumulates in cells, more leptin is produced. This rise in leptin indicates that fat stores are increasing. Leptin binds to and activates a protein called the leptin receptor, fitting into the receptor like a key into a lock. The leptin receptor protein is found on the surface of cells in many organs and tissues of the body, including a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls hunger and thirst, as well as other functions, such as sleep, moods, and body temperature. It also regulates the release of many hormones that have functions throughout the body. In the hypothalamus, the binding of leptin to its receptor triggers a series of chemical signals that affect hunger and help produce a feeling of fullness or satiety. So it could be, in this case, that the obese man is suffering from congenital leptin deficiency. Of course, the mutations that lead to this are rare, but not knowing anything else about the case, it is a possible hypothesis. Another hypothesis may involve leptin in a different way. In a manner not too dissimilar to the development of diabetes mellitus 2, where the pancreas produces insulin, but the, but the cells develop insulin resistance, preventing them from responding correctly, over time, overeating in certain individuals can lead to leptin resistance. And because leptin normally reduces food intake and weight, the coterminous presence of elevated leptin and obesity suggests a resistance to leptin signaling, which helps to inform the person to stop eating, and the path that leads to leptin resistance might be explained by other neuropsychological problems, since it tends to occur in individuals who are already overweight. Quote, there is also supporting neurological evidence for the argument from observed behavioral similarities between overeating and substance dependence, neurobiological results from animal models, human neuroimaging studies, and genetic research on susceptibility to obesity. Indeed, the similarities between some forms of overeating and drug addiction might derive from the same imbalance in certain neural pathways that mediate the motivation to eat certain foods or take drugs, and those that control the urges. The dopamine reward pathway is central to this goal-directed behavior. Pleasurable activities such as eating, sex, or drug use trigger the release of dopamine into an area of the midbrain called the nucleus accumbens. This release of dopamine signals that these activities are worth repeating. However, the excessive consumption of food or drugs can dysregulate the system to the point that pursuit of these rewarding activities dominates an individual's behavior. However, although most abused drugs act directly on the dopamine reward pathway, repeated carbohydrate and sugar ingestion act indirectly by affecting palatability and increasing insulin and glucose secretion. The opioid neurotransmitter system then links the palatability or pleasure effects of food with the reward system. Endogenous opioids subsequently trigger higher levels of dopamine release in the striatum, thereby reinforcing the consumption of food. Opioids might also reinforce food cravings, as indicated by the analgesic effects of sweet foods and the findings that drug-blocking opioids also reduce food intake. It is the overuse of these endogenous opioids that dampens the system so as to produce the high levels of endorphins observed in obese individuals. In fact, the abnormal neurotransmitter levels found in obese animals and humans are similar to those seen in chronic drug abusers. So the reality of the case of this hypothetical obese man is that there are multiple possibilities to account for his state, none of which have anything to do with anything divine or some lack of mystical willpower. 
The realism-based worldview is one that necessarily incorporates multiple hypotheses that can be and often are interlinked with each other, as is the case above with a disturbance in neural pathways leading to possible overeating to begin with, which later on leads to possible morbid obesity due to leptin resistance because the more adipose tissue one has, the greater potential production of leptin because leptin itself is produced by adipose cells, which eventually leads to the inability to respond to leptin signaling, thus reinforcing a complex feedback loop begun by the imbalances in neural pathways. Possible solutions can only come about through proper understanding, whether it comes to the problem of obesity or any other. The same principle of dissection and understanding should be applied to social problems as well, as we shall see later. Having willpower, or lack of willpower, does not cut it as an explanation. And despite all these advances in the science of metabolism, when you see an obese person, the most common explanation offered is lack of willpower. I should note that obesity as a scientific phenomenon is not the focus of this video. But I cite it and talk about it because of the methodology used to diagnose and critically analyze a problem without resorting to what effectively are non-explanatory explanations, obviously an oxymoronic phrase, but one that captures everything wrong with our modern age, namely useless feel-goodisms and instinctual responses that advance and change nothing. And this above all is the challenge we face in transitioning from an age of optimism and let's face it, lack of explanations, to an age of realism. As I shall explain later, it is absolutely critical that we do so. <clears throat> I posed the question earlier as to how viable a system is, which for the purposes of this discussion I refer to as the Enlightenment system, in consideration of a modern understanding of the human ape, in particular in consideration of possible disparities in the ethical intuitions between men and women. We now turn our discussion to the increasing body of knowledge documenting fairly pronounced differences in the perception of ethics, morality, and justice in women and men respectively, and how some of these differences might possibly be incompatible with an enlightenment system of justice and equity. Increasingly, there has been study on the subject of ethical and moral intuitions and the differences between the sexes, and slowly but surely there appears to be a convergence of agreement. An introduction to the direction these studies have taken is encapsulated in the following excerpt. Quote, put yourself in the position of Michelle, a single mother of four children. Michelle's life is a mess. She lives in a crowded three-room apartment with four kids and her elderly mother whose medical bills have grown unbearable in recent months. As Michelle reflects on all these difficulties, she sees a woman, draped in fur, emerge from a Cadillac. The woman's wallet falls from her purse to the ground. Michelle picks up the wallet and discovers, to her amazement, that it is stuffed with hundred-dollar bills. She only has an instant to decide whether to chase after the woman or slip the wallet into her own purse. If she returns the money to the woman, who, from the looks of it, can probably afford to lose it, she will give up a chance to take care of her family responsibilities. But keeping the money isn't fair to the woman, regardless of her financial position. Stealing, after all, is wrong, isn't it? What would you do? Recent research on such ethical dilemmas suggests that when confronted with such choices, good-willed individuals may choose either to return the wallet or to keep the money, depending on the ethical perspective that they use to frame ethical questions. What's more, Harvard psychologist Carol Gilligan believes that differences in ethic perspective are related to gender, that is, that men and women follow different but parallel paths of moral development that lead them to make their ethical choice based on different ethical criteria. In the literature, there are two lines of moral reasoning, as it were, the male fairness imperative and the female care imperative. Originally conceived by the Swiss-French psychologist Jean Piaget, the American psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg worked on and further developed a hierarchy of moral development in human beings. Quote, Kohlberg postulated that there were three levels of moral maturity. At the earliest and least mature level, children typically define right and wrong in terms of what authority figure tells them is right and wrong, or in terms of what results in reward or punishment. The second level is typical of adolescents, who tend to base right and wrong on loyalties to their family and friends. The third and most mature level 
is achieved when a person comes to rely on universal abstract ethical principles, such as the principles of justice or equality that impartially take into account the interests of all persons. This view of ethical development has been widely accepted, but has been challenged by some, such as Carol Gilligan, who argues the following, quote, Gilligan's research over the past 11 years suggests that women tend to be more concerned than men with maintaining good relationships with their family and friends and with minimizing hurt to those whom they care about, characteristic of Kohlberg's second level of moral maturity. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to look at moral issues from the standpoint of impartial and impersonal principles, characteristic of the third and most mature level. By implication, then, women appear, according to the standards developed by Kohlberg, to reach the third and most mature level much less frequently than men, and therefore to be less morally developed than men. But Gilligan's work challenges this interpretation. The problem, she claims, is not women, but the theory of moral development that Kohlberg worked out. Kohlberg's theory canonized the justice perspective favored by males because he and most of his subjects were male. Gilligan's research on women revealed, however, that a care perspective could also be a morally mature stage of moral reasoning, but one that is more favored by females. Gilligan's research shows that women, more than men, view themselves as part of a network of relationships and feel that sustaining these relationships is a moral imperative. Central to this, quote-unquote, female ethic are notions of care and responsibility for others. By contrast, the male ethic of Kohlberg's third level is one based on abstract impersonal principles. Gilligan argues that for most women, progress towards moral maturity is marked by changes in the focus of caring, not by the development of the abstract impersonal principles that Kohlberg proposes. In the care perspective, the earliest level of moral development, she claims, is one marked by a concern with caring only for oneself. At the second level, others become the focus of caring. At the third level of moral development, the morally mature person achieves a balance between caring for others and caring for oneself. Gilligan argues for what is called the ethics of care, which is, according to her, a parallel ethical system favored by women where the central question is of how do I respond versus the system favored by men where the central question is what is just. There are many implications if we consider this parallel system, but first let us examine some of the data that researchers have produced that lend credence to this gender-separated ethical system. Leslie L. Dawson published an article entitled Women and Men, Morality and Ethics, offering the following as an introduction to the article. One of today's most important trends is the increased participation of women in the workforce, particularly of women holding management positions in businesses. This trend has generated a research interest in numerous issues concerning the impact of women on business practices. One such issue is whether there's a gender difference in ethical decision making. Do men and women differ in their moral reasoning and judgments? If so, what are the implications for ethical conduct in the work environment? The article goes on to detail the results of a study in which male and female marketing managers are given hypothetical scenarios concerning business ethics, detailing very different outcomes and response depending on the sex of the person. Here are some examples of the scenarios. Hypothetical scenario one was as follows. You are the manager of a local toy store. The hottest Christmas toy of the year is the new Peter Panda stuffed animal. The toy is in great demand and almost impossible to find. You have received your one and only shipment of twelve, and they are all promised to people who previously stopped in to place a deposit and reserve one. A woman comes by the store and pleads with you, saying that her six-year-old daughter is in the hospital, very ill, and that Peter Panda is the one toy that she has her heart set on. Would you sell her one, knowing that you would have to break your promise and refund the deposit to one of the customers? And then some brackets here. There is no way you will be able to get an extra toy in time. Now, the results of scenario one were as follows. In terms of decisions, males would sell 28% of the time, would not sell 66% of the time, and were unsure of their decision 6% of the time. Females, on the other hand, would sell 57% of the time, would not sell 28% of the time, and were unsure 15% of the time. Hypothetical scenario six was as follows. As a sales manager for an office equipment firm, you are considering three candidates for an open sales position. The best qualified in terms of background and experience happens to be an individual who recently suffered severe facial disfigurement and the loss of both hands in rescuing a motorist from a burning car. You are concerned that potential customers 
might be made extremely uncomfortable by this candidate's appearance. You have a possible legal quote-unquote out under equal opportunity laws insofar as the handicap could be construed as interfering with a person's ability to perform all aspects of the job, i.e. carrying bulky demonstration units into prospects' offices. Would you offer the title job to a handicapped person? And the results of scenario six were as follows. In terms of decisions, males would 33% of the time offer the position to the handicapped person, 59% of the time would not offer the position and were unsure of their decision 8% of the time. Females, on the other hand, would offer the position 41% of the time, would not offer the position 48% of the time, and were unsure 11% of the time. There are, of course, six possible scenarios in total, and a link to this and everything else will be provided in the low bar as usual. But I now wish to move on to some of the conclusions of the article. Now, figure 7 details the conclusions drawn from the participant's statements. So the conclusions were as follows. In solving ethical dilemmas, females are likely to primarily respect feelings, ask who will be hurt, avoid being judgmental, search for compromise, seek solutions that minimize hurt, rely on communication, believe in contextual relativism, be guided by emotion, and challenge authority. In solving ethical dilemmas, males are likely to primarily respect rights, as in who is right, value decisiveness, make unambiguous decisions, seek solutions that are objectively fair, rely on rules, believe in blind impartiality, be guided by logic, and accept authority. Finally, an article titled Gender Responses to Moral Dilemmas, a Process Dissociation Analysis states the following. The principle of deontology states that the morality of an action depends on its consistency with moral norms. The principle of utilitarianism implies that the morality of an action depends on its consequences. Previous research suggests that deontological judgments are shaped by affective processes, whereas utilitarian judgments are guided by cognitive processes. The current research used process dissociation to independently assess deontological and utilitarian inclinations in women and men. A meta-analytic reanalysis of 40 studies with 6,100 participants indicated that men showed a stronger preference for utilitarian over deontological judgments than women when the two principles implied conflicting decisions. PD further revealed that women exhibited stronger deontological inclinations than men, while men exhibited only slightly stronger utilitarian inclinations than women. The findings suggest that gender differences in moral dilemma judgments are due to differences in affective responses to harm rather than cognitive evaluations of outcomes. Studies and articles, such as the ones above, indicate that the gender divide between men and women is not only great in terms of morphological and physiological differences, but also that the differences penetrate into our very ethical intuitions and can have potential consequences in a system of justice and, by extension, the way a society is run and how it functions. The data suggests that men, on average, are more concerned with efficiency, abstract fairness, and utilitarianism, and that women, on average, are concerned with how they and others feel, i.e. affective responses, contextual moral relativism, and direct consequences, i.e. deontological judgments. Unfortunately, although sex-based ethical intuitions have been fairly well studied, there has not been corresponding study, to the best of my knowledge, on the evolution of these intuitions. But I do believe it possible to present a hypothesis as to why men and women develop divergent moral systems. Reproductive limitations show themselves time and again to be the primary determinant in sex-distinctive behavior that we can observe, such as women's overwhelming tendency to go into fields with a strong social emphasis, such as social work, teaching, psychology, etc., as well as their overwhelming tendency to avoid dangerous and dirty work, such as sewage management, king crab fishing, and working on sea-bound oil refineries in addition to working shorter hours on average and being more concerned with work-life balance. Women evolved in an environment where the care-based morality naturally had greater consequence because of the fact that they had to nurse and raise young offspring. Questions of right and wrong in the abstract do not figure into the needs of a crying baby, whether it cries for reasons of hunger or otherwise, and thus immediate attention or care had to be given to it. Women also did not need to compete with each other in status-driven competition as men did, which was often brutal, allowing for a greater focus on forming harmonious relationships, which serves to explain why women tend to be more concerned with interpersonal relationships. The care-driven ethical intuition fits into the greater picture of sex-specific behaviors informed by the reproductive limitations imposed on women via natural selection. 
Conversely, one can hypothesize that the same limiting reproductive forces that drive men in their work choices, their willingness to work long hours, to engage in dangerous work, to gravitate towards high-paying jobs, and to do jobs that require a high degree of spatial reasoning, such as engineering, coincide with the quote-unquote abstract fairness morality of men. Men had to engage in long hunting forays in cooperation with other men, and needed to focus on making the execution of the task they engaged in as efficient as possible, in addition to having to engage in the vast majority of building and planning, the greater tendency for an abstract principle-based morality coincides with the challenges faced by men, just as the caring, feeling-based morality of women coincides with the challenges they faced. Finally, the necessity of male-on-male -male competition likely necessitated a strict adherence to rules of competition, abstract principles that would help guide the conduct in such competitions. And before I proceed to connecting the dots, I do wish to state, once and only once, for the benefit of those who don't understand averages or the purpose and reason of generalizations, that these are typical or average intuitions and preferences of the sexes. Exceptions will always exist, but by their very nature, exceptions confirm a rule that is widely applicable to the group within which they are deemed exceptional. We can look at examples from the business world as well as other professions that coincide with the female ethical imperative to see how these different ethical imperatives play out in the real world. Take for example the issue of maternity leave. One of the most progressive companies on the issue of maternity leave has been Google, which in recent years increased its benefits to women going on maternity leave from 12 weeks to 18 weeks of paid maternity leave. To understand the kind of thinking behind this and how it relates to differing moral values between the sexes we can examine statements made by the CEO of YouTube, quote, I was Google's first employee to go on maternity leave. In 1999, I joined the startup that founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin had recently started in my garage. I was four months pregnant. At the time, the company had no revenue and only 15 employees, all of whom were male. Joining a startup pregnant with my first child was risky, but Larry and Sergey assured me I'd have their support. This month, I'll go on maternity leave once again, my fifth time, joining the nearly 5,000 women who have done so since I joined Google. And though I'm now CEO of YouTube, which is owned by Google, I'll be entitled to the same benefits as every single woman at the company who has a baby, 18 weeks of paid maternity leave. Having experienced how valuable paid maternity leave is to me, my family, and my career, I never thought of it as a privilege. But the sad truth is that paid maternity leave is rare in the United States, and the U.S. lags behind the rest of the world in providing for the needs of pregnant women and new mothers. And she continues, There are two ways women in America can receive paid maternity leave. They can work for a generous employer that provides it as a benefit, or they can live in one of the few states, California, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island, that have publicly funded paid maternity leave laws. According to the Labor Department, that patchwork of corporate and state benefits covers only 12% of private workers. Low-wage earners, those in the bottom income quartile, have it much worse. Only 5% get any paid maternity leave. The Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993 is a step in the right direction, but it is unpaid and doesn't cover half the working women in the U.S. In study after study, the ILO and other labor and health organizations have shown how harmful a lack of paid maternity leave can be for mothers and their babies. Many times when faced with insufficient maternity leave, mothers choose to drop out of the workforce, leading to a considerable loss of income during a woman's most productive years. Or it can force a woman back to work too quickly with adverse effects on her and her child's health. Paid maternity leave is also good for business. After California instituted paid maternity leave, a survey in 2011 by the Center for Economic and Policy Research found that 91% of employers said the policy either boosted profits or had no effect. They also noted improved productivity, higher morale, and reduced turnover. That last one is one we've seen at Google. When we increased paid maternity leave from 12 to 18 weeks in 2007, the rate at which new moms left Google fell by 50%. We also increased paternity leave to 12 weeks from 7, as we know this has a positive effect on families in our business. Mothers were able to take the time they needed to bond with their babies and return to their jobs feeling confident and ready. And it's much better for Google's bottom line to avoid costly turnover and to retain the valued expertise, skills, 
and perspectives of our employees who are mothers. Best of all, mothers come back to the workforce with new insights. I know from experience that being a mother gave me a broader sense of purpose, more compassion, and a better ability to prioritize and get things done efficiently. It also helped me understand the specific needs and concerns of mothers who make most household spending decisions and control more than $2 trillion of purchasing power in the U.S. I've been lucky to have the support of a company that values motherhood as much as Google, and I've been lucky to live in a state like California that supports working mothers. But support for motherhood shouldn't be a matter of luck. It should be a matter of course. Paid maternity leave is good for mothers, families, and businesses. America should have the good sense to join nearly every other country in providing it. End quote. There's a great deal to cover here, but we can notice the care-based morality being consistently expressed throughout the statements made by YouTube CEO. Statements such as valuing motherhood and providing for the needs of working women and mothers. There is also the bold claim that paying someone to effectively take an 18-week vacation increases profitability for the company and or does not harm it. And that is a very difficult statement from my end to quantify. One way to look at it is to pose the question as to whether or not an employee who does not take off 18 weeks for paid vacation and continues to work throughout would not be more profitable than having to hire a temp worker who is likely less qualified and pay someone to take a vacation based on a personal choice they make, i.e. becoming pregnant. Do the costs involved in the 18-week paid maternity leave, including searching and hiring a temporary employee, as well as paying someone not directly contributing to the company actually outweigh simply maintaining a skilled worker who will continue to directly contribute to the company for the 18-week period. Unfortunately, there are no direct studies on this, but logic and common sense would dictate that the person who stays on for 18 weeks and directly contributes will contribute more to the bottom line than someone who leaves for 18 weeks, with all the attendant costs, such as hiring temps and trying to find qualified people. So whilst it might not directly hurt the bottom line, it is almost certainly not as profitable as having someone stay and work for the 18-week paid absence that is seen as a necessity and right as proposed by the CEO of YouTube. Jay Maletsky, on the other hand, founder and CEO of SQL Media International, offers a number of counter-arguments, and we're going to listen to them here to see how the gender division ethical perspectives in business comes into play. Let's start by understanding the purpose of a corporation in the first place. A company exists because a person or group of people saw a need in a market and an opportunity to profit by satisfying that need. The investors in that company have put money into it with the hope and expectation that they will see a positive return on their investment through future profits earned through the sale of products and or services provided by that company. In the process, the company buys equipment and materials and services, helping other companies flourish in the process and hires individuals to complete tasks, creating jobs for those people. And that's it. That's their purpose, to generate a profit for their investors. With that as their core purpose, other tangential benefits arise, like increased employment, increased taxable income, and more. Some companies do well enough that they can give back to their local communities or get involved with various charities, and that's their choice to do so when they feel financially able to. Similarly, some companies offer generous benefits, such as paid maternity leave, as a means of attracting the best talent. Companies that can't afford this benefit either need to settle for less talented employees or offer other benefits that may be more affordable to them, and similarly appealing to potential employees. It's basic principles of supply and demand, without the need for the government forcing a company's hand. Employees typically understand the benefit package a company offers before they accept an offer for employment. It's selfish and petty to accept a job under a specified number of conditions, only to whine about those conditions later on, when your own situation changes and the benefits package you once agreed to is no longer convenient for you. The reality is, for many companies of all sizes, paid maternity leave is simply too expensive. It's not unusual for companies to run on very tight budgets with very little wiggle room for additional expenses. Hard-working entrepreneurs everywhere often work without taking a salary for long periods of time in order to stay afloat and realize their vision. Paying three months' salary to a suddenly non-productive employee simply because they made the decision to have a child would strain many small businesses beyond the brink of insolvency. If maternity leave was mandated, 
Many companies would have to make up the differences by laying off other employees or raising prices of their products and services, ultimately hurting customers. And what of the other employees who are not having babies? They would be, in effect, punished for not having children by virtue of the fact that their salaries would be lower than a pregnant woman per productive hour. Consider a situation in which two employees make the same annual salary. One employee gets pregnant and takes three months maternity leave during which the company is forced to pay her full salary. If the annual salary is calculated on a per productive hour basis, the employee on maternity leave, having fewer productive hours than her coworker, ends up making more for each hour actually worked. The employee who didn't choose to have a baby is punished for not having a child and working three months longer. Inevitably, this will cause the employee to complain and demand either higher salaries to make up the difference or want similar paid leave, two options that will negatively affect the company, overall employment, and prices charged to consumers. Now, if you pay close attention to who is speaking and what is being said, you can essentially see the dichotomy here that the arguments are being made along sex-driven lines. Whereas the CEO of YouTube argues from a viewpoint of the needs of women and mothers, care for their children, and the necessity of companies and governments to intervene and provide for their female employees to accommodate their needs and desires, Jay Miletsky argues differently, that companies exist to make profits for their shareholders, that pregnancy is a personal choice, not a need that must be addressed by a private company, that small companies, unlike Google, simply cannot afford government-mandated maternity leave. And finally, that paid maternity leave is unfair to workers who do not make that choice and continue to work and can lead to worker discontent, which can negatively affect the company. One CEO, a woman, argues from a personalized feeling-based morality. The other CEO, a man, argues from a depersonalized fairness-based morality. And this exemplifies the differences between men and women on aggregate. The bigger picture of the female ethical imperative is that feelings and considerations of not hurting other people are a driving force behind many of the modern trends and policies we see today. Social justice in its current incarnation is very much an embodiment of the feeling, care-based morality that women often display. The demand for equal treatment, and by that is meant feeling equal rather than actual equal treatment, is embodied by modern social justice, is an extension of the female interpretation of egalitarianism, which is not the same as the classical liberal definition of egalitarianism, which implies equality before the law, not equal outcomes, or even opportunities for that matter. Today, egalitarianism has almost universally come to be understood by most people as equality of status, opportunities, outcomes, and above all, accommodating the wants and needs of any group that is deemed insufficiently represented. We will discuss the conflict brought about by different moral perspectives shortly, but let us take some time to look at and examine how the care and need-based morality can negatively impact certain professions that require efficient standards to be maintained. Many might be aware that the NHS, or the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, has been in terrible shape in recent years, and there has been the suggestion, indeed by doctors, that the choices made by female healthcare professionals may be contributing to the problem. In a 2014 article, Professor and Dr. J. Marin Thomas stated the following, quote, For many years, until the 60s, fewer than 10% of British doctors were female. Then things changed. For the past four decades, about 60% of students selected for training in UK medical schools have been female. This is understandable in academic terms because girls achieve slightly better A-level grades than boys. They also mature earlier and may present themselves more impressively to medical school selection committees at the age of 17. The effect is beginning to be seen. In 2012, a total of 252,553 doctors were registered with the General Medical Council. The male-to-female ratio was 57 to 43 percent. However, in its annual report last year, the GMC documented the changes in the UK medical register between 2007 and 2012. The most significant change was that the number of female doctors under the age of 30 had increased by 18 percent, while the number of male doctors decreased by 1 percent. Indeed, in this age group, 61% of doctors are now women and 39% men. In the age group 30 to 50 years over the same period, the number of female doctors increased by 24% compared with 2% for males. In this age group, 
Men still outnumber women by 54% to 46%, but that ratio will soon reverse. I fear this gender imbalance is already having a negative effect on the NHS. The reason is that most female doctors end up working part-time, usually in general practice, and then retire early. As a result, it is necessary to train two female doctors so they can cover the same amount of work as one full-time colleague. Given that the cost of training a doctor is at least 500000 sterling, are taxpayers getting the best return on their investment? There is another issue. Women in hospital medicine tend to avoid the more demanding specialties which require greater commitment, have more antisocial working hours, and include the responsibility for management. Instead of taking on a specialist career, many women prefer to look for a better work-life balance when they have young children of their own. And Dr. Max Pemberton has echoed similar sentiments. Quote, we are facing a crisis in the NHS. It's not a crisis caused by obesity or dementia or binge drinking. It's a crisis caused by having too many women doctors. Now, before I'm inundated with accusations of misogyny, hear me out, because I'm not suggesting for a moment that the women themselves are to blame. Nevertheless, they are bringing the NHS to its knees. And if we don't do something about it soon, there will be profound consequences. This week, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Care gave a stark warning that children's wards face closure because so many pediatricians are now women and have gone on maternity leave or work part-time. There simply aren't enough senior doctors left to run departments anymore. Three-quarters of doctors training in pediatrics are women. The situation has become so bad in some areas that up to 63% of shifts are now being covered by locums. In other specialties that attract women, such as general practice, where two-thirds of GPs are women, a similar staffing disaster is unfolding. It's affected mental health, too, which traditionally has always attracted female doctors. In my own department in the past year, four doctors out of eight have gone on maternity leave. More and more women are coming into medicine in some medical schools, as many as 80% of students are now female, suggesting the problem is only going to get worse. Both doctors have noted the tendency of women to gravitate towards certain sectors of medicine, to work fewer hours, and to leave for the sake of having children. In both these cases, the doctors cited statistics and specific problems, and the responses to them were largely those you might be familiar with, cries of offense and accusations of misogyny. And now we are really coming to the fundamental problem, which is the focus of this video. Women and men are not only different in terms of preferences and personality, but in their fundamental worldview, as exemplified by the ethics of care for women, which focuses on interpersonal relationships, inclusivity, and the ethics of fairness, which focuses on justice, efficiency, and principles. One is personal, the other is abstract. Neither has a better moral quality attached to it per se, as these differing ethical approaches merely are what they are, just as short people are short and tall people are tall. However, just as it is unlikely a short person will be competitive in the NBA as compared to a taller person, so too is it unlikely in certain contexts that one ethical system is as functional and as good as the other. If we return to the problem in medicine, for example, the female moral perspective that attention should be paid to individual wants and needs of women, be it flexible hours, maternity leave, and personal choice, has over the decades led to potentially catastrophic infrastructural problems within the NHS, and is likely one of the factors leading to its demise. It can be argued that an adherence to abstract principles, such as fair distribution and the need to fill different roles in medicine, as opposed to mere personal choice and the ability to see the bigger picture, which exemplifies the male ethical system, is objectively better for the medical sector if one wishes to maintain its efficacy. That is not to say there is no room for a caring, individual, attention-based system in the world. There are instances where this is arguably the better system. Take, for instance, a young pupil who is a slow learner that needs extra attention and encouragement in order to make progress and improve. In such an instance, the personalized moral system is almost certainly better, particularly if the individual has untapped potential that requires a bit of gentle coaxing. Both systems have their place, but neither system appears to be appropriate in terms of universal application in every situation and context, and we will explore that further shortly. The evidence suggests that moral systems evolved in concert with the reproductive needs and limitations imposed on men and women respectively, and given that, there are, in fact, other further complicating issues that appear to interfere with the application of both the caring female ethical imperative and the fairness male ethical imperative. 
I am speaking, of course, of the base biological instincts that were almost certainly in place before complex moral thought ever had been considered. Most of us are familiar with female in-group bias by now, but few have taken into consideration the interplay that bias could potentially have within the context of a moral system that at least theoretically is meant to be universal in its application. Before examining those considerations, let us first look at how female in-group preference has been studied and documented. Quote, women are nearly five times more likely to show an automatic preference for their own gender than men are to show such favoritism for their own gender, according to a study in the October issue of the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Through four experiments, psychologists Laurier Rudman of Rutgers and Stephanie A. Goodwin of Purdue University used the implicit association test to discover 204 heterosexual college students' automatic gender preferences and gender identity by asking them to associate positive and negative gender-free words with either men or women. They also tested participants' self-esteem by asking them to associate those words with I or others. Both male and female participants associated the positive words, such as good, happy, and sunshine, more often with women than with men, Rudman says. Moreover, men and women tended to show high implicit self-esteem and high gender identity. However, men showed low pro-male gender attitudes, according to the study. A clear pattern shown in all four studies is that men do not like themselves automatically as much as women like themselves, Redmond says. This contradicts a lot of the theoretical thinking and implicit attitudes regarding status differences. More specifically, men are historically and cross-culturally viewed as the dominant sex, so it might logically follow that they'd have a greater in-group bias, Rudman says. To explore why their study found the opposite pattern, Rudman and Goodwin evaluate several possible reasons. They found women's high self-esteem and female identity, on average, bolstered their automatic liking for women, whereas men's liking for men did not rely on high self-esteem or masculine identity. In other words, women can be characterized as thinking, quote-unquote, if I am good and I am female, females are good, whereas men can be characterized as thinking, even if I am good and I am male, men are not necessarily good. Men and women who implicitly favored their mothers over their fathers, such as by associating more positive words with their mothers than their fathers, also showed a pro-female bias, which suggests the influence of maternal bonding on gender preferences. In addition, people who report being raised primarily by their mothers also showed pro-female bias, on the IAT. Researchers using self-reports found no self-evidence that maternal attitudes influence gender attitudes. In concert, these results are consistent with the theory that developmental events can influence implicit attitudes more than explicit attitudes, Rudman says. The implication of the study is that women tend to have a collective gender identity and men do not, with the following considerations. If women on aggregate tend to collectivize themselves and see each other as being linked to each other, but men do not, then there will almost certainly be interference stemming from this particular psychological trait when applied to the moral psychology of the genders, specifically that the implication of the female caring morality is not generally applied to men because of in-group preference, and conversely, the abstract fairness morality of men tends not to be applied evenly in unisex settings because of men's inherent desire to please women and their fondness for them the latter sometimes being referred to as benevolent sexism, such as when men bypass the rules they establish for themselves and apply them differently to women. Before we proceed to how the sexists use different moral intuitions to interpret abstractions, such as egalitarianism and equity, let us consider the following data. Cancer is the leading cause of death in the health domain in the United States after heart disease. Let's look at some stats. Quote, the top killers, lung and bronchial cancers, killed about 155,000 people in 2014, or about 49 deaths per 100,000 people. Colon and rectal cancers claimed about 16 lives per 100,000 people. And breast cancer took about 13 lives per 100,000 people. Pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer followed with about 12.7 and 9 deaths per 100 people, respectively. The American Cancer Society lists the amount of money in the form of grants given to specific types of cancer. In early 2016, breast cancer received funded amounts and grants for a total of $102,098,479. Lung cancer received $51,076,624, 
and prostate cancer received $44,289,776. Despite the fact that lung cancer kills at about 3.76 times the rate of breast cancer, it only received a little more than half the amount given to breast cancer. And despite reasonably close rates of death between breast cancer and prostate cancer, prostate cancer received less than half of the amount for breast cancer. The specific amounts, as opposed to the funded amounts, show even greater discrepancies. Breast cancer received a specific amount of $74,304,132. Lung cancer, $29,858,567. And prostate cancer, $26,921,704. Whilst this does not tell us the amount of effort or research being done for the respective cancers, it does tell us how funding is prioritized for cancer. With breast cancer receiving far more funding than lung cancer, a much deadlier form of cancer, and prostate cancer with a somewhat similar mortality rate. This indicates, at the very least, some kind of skewing in terms of what society deems important that actually runs counter to what, in the abstract sense, would be considered fair and equitable. After all, if lung cancer kills people at almost four times the rate breast cancer does, the fair and indeed irrational thing would be to pour more grant money into combating lung cancer rather than breast cancer. Yet we do not see this. Now many anti-feminists spend inordinate amounts of time combating social justice warriors and trying to relate the classical concept of egalitarianism to them, thinking they can be reasoned out of their position. But what they do not understand is that the modern concept of social justice was forged in the fires of emotion, not reason. Feminism, social justice, modern egalitarianism are all about the feels. So, theoretically, one could get women on board, for example, with supporting a classical definition of equality, but what this usually ends up being is little more than lip service, and when push comes to shove, the feelings take over. Let's take the information mentioned above concerning cancer funding, for example. I'm quite certain you could get women to pay lip service agreement to the idea that apportioning the funds should be done on the basis of risk of death by cancer type, but when put up against the wall, with the realization that this could mean less funding for themselves personally, I'm fairly certain that I could hypothesize that that lip service agreement would end. What people like the Lord of Akkad either do not publicly acknowledge or do not understand is that women interpret principles such as egalitarianism from the standpoint of emotional and personal needs, not one of fairness and equity. They hear the same thing, but compute it differently to men, generally speaking, in terms of their cognition and psychology. If the sexes do indeed run on different moral software, as the evidence suggests, then men and women, in terms of what they actually perceive the end product of egalitarianism to be, are vastly different. How do we know this? There are signals everywhere. Take, for instance, this article from the Mail Online with the following title and content. Agony of being a 50-50 mum. Women once held the upper hand in custody battles. Now fathers are winning equal access, and mothers are struggling to cope. Nicola Hewitt, 42, an office manager from Kenley, Surrey, faces the trauma of being without her children, Devon 10 and Sunny 8 every weekend. This is the reality for Britain's growing legion of 50-50 mothers who divide their time with the children equally with their exes. It's a growing phenomenon that, on the surface, might seem the fairest way for separated parents to organize their lives, but it comes at an emotional price for the mothers involved, and the consequences for children are as yet untold. And Teal Deer did a recent video on a concept called me Eternity Leave, the idea that women should be allowed to take the equivalent of paid maternity leave because they feel they should have it. And finally, the realization that women working longer may potentially be reducing their health and longevity. Quote, At Harvard University, Lisa Berkman, director of the Center for Population and Development Studies, says challenging social conditions in the U.S. have created a so-called perfect storm that can damage women's health. Not only did women flood into the job market over the past decade, she notes, but the number of single parents skyrocketed. Despite these major changes, the U.S. has created few policies to help women handle childcare. As a result, there are quote-unquote extreme stresses, even on the relatively advantaged, she said. Job stress can be particularly damaging for employees who hold jobs with rigid hours and high demands such as clerical, administrative, or production work, researchers have found. When Berkman studied women stressed by work and family conflict, 
She found they had more medical issues than other working women. She looked at women who worked in elder care facilities, comparing those who had rigid and flexible job schedules. Women with rigid schedules were twice as likely as women with more flexibility to have at least two risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, being overweight, or smoking, Berkman found. Notice that in none of the cases cited above do questions of justice, fairness, or equity come into play. And this very much illustrates the extreme likelihood of a feeling and care-based moral system that is far more prevalent in women than it is in men. After all, 50-50 custody should be regarded as a good thing, since in the classical sense of the word, it represents equal treatment. And whilst reduced health and longevity is not a good thing, it is the consequence of the same system of work requirements that men have had to deal with for decades, with few to none of the concerns expressed above for them. The fundamental question posed at the beginning of this video remains, can the abstract principles embodied in Enlightenment values such as fairness, justice, and equity be adequately represented, and most importantly, respected if these are symbolic of a male moral imperative as opposed to a care-based female one? Social justice and feminism demand and require respect for feelings and personal interests, such as whether X number of people from whatever minority group they choose is being adequately represented at a university or company, but we have seen the disastrous effects quotas have had on businesses and education, implemented just so people can feel good about themselves. Have you ever wondered why our society is shot through with pathological altruism, where each and every person, assuming he's not a white male, should get a special place at the table because he or she exists? Neither the male-oriented fairness morality nor the female-oriented caring morality have, in and of themselves, any particular positive or negative value in the abstract. However, we cannot deny that these different moral perspectives have consequences for a plethora of structures that make up what we call society. A society that shuns abstract principles of fairness and efficiency when those very principles have been the bedrock of said society and were what allowed human civilization to advance as far as it has, will regress, and we have definitely seen a regression. There are huge real-world consequences for the disallowance of competition in education, business, and life in general. Huge superstructures require the effective implementation of abstract principles to run effectively in the long run, not preferential treatment, individualized care, and avoidance of hurt people's feelings. We call that meritocracy. But meritocracy as a principle is not one that exists well in concert with a feeling and caring based morality. And this is part of the problem. At the beginning of the video, I spoke of the ages of gods and optimism. But increasingly, the flavor of the age is one of denial, coupled with bouts of optimism when it's deemed suitable. We shall forever remain optimistic until some bit of data or information shatters that optimism into a thousand pieces, in which case we deny, deny, and deny until we cannot deny any more. The yes-we-can attitude that has become so characteristic of our age has now begun to hurt us. I find it routinely amusing when I'm called a defeatist or a nihilist or someone who just doesn't care. I wish to see humanity improve and overcome its limitations. On the contrary, it is in fact defeatist to make use of euphemisms such as anti-egalitarianism to describe gynocentrism for a number of reasons. First, it does not accurately describe the content of what gynocentrism entails, how it works, what its origins are, why we are so drawn to it, etc. Second, if egalitarianism as a concept is in fact, as I have hypothesized, fundamentally interpreted differently by men and women, then using the term anti-egalitarianism will have as little impact as egalitarianism itself convincing the masses of its value. It's puzzling to me that people ask the question, what good is knowing all of this stuff? This, it seems to me, is akin to asking what good learning anatomy is for a doctor or seismology for a geologist. I will bring up the example of the obese man again. Only by understanding how the neurotransmitters and hormones interact in the body can one actually make a proper diagnosis for treatment. Screaming willpower, we know, has little to no effect. But that's just it, is it not? The age of gods might be gone, but there are far, far too many of us who still voluntarily adorn themselves with articles of faith. Why did the Lord of Akkad seek to ban social justice from universities? Why? Because it is anti-egalitarian. But then again, 
So is four to five months paid maternity leave whilst non-pregnant workers continue to work with no such benefits. But we can't talk about that, can we? Those of us who seek to understand, to unravel the human condition, are called defeatists and nihilists because when properly appraised, overcoming the human condition, with all the attendant negative attributes we possess, requires the absolute and intransigent devotion to truth, evidence, and does not allow us to shy away from things that make us uncomfortable, uneasy, and above all, make us realize just how ordinary and unremarkable animals we in fact are. And overcome we must, for if we do not, we as a species and civilization are surely doomed. The only way to actually change anything is the ruthless and fearless pursuit of reality. And now I finally begin to see cracks and fissures in the hard rock of the edifice of denial of that modern-day optimism that is little more than mystical faith. Blow by blow, we edge ever so slightly towards understanding, acceptance, and with that, the infinitesimally small chance of actually turning this train we call humanity around, this train currently bound to run off a cliff. Reality demands of us honesty. Thus, we do not mince words, nor are we here to run a perpetual PR campaign to appease the masses so their feelings will not be hurt. We simply cannot afford it. Faith, whether of the religious sort or the optimistic sort, must be replaced by cold and principled understanding. And now, perchance, you'll permit me an ostensible digression. When I was young, I was an avid reader of fantasy. There was a series of books called The War of the Lance, which took place on the fantasy world of Kryn. The Great War was being fought against the forces of darkness. The heroes of light were few in number, lost in purpose, and adrift in a sea of hopelessness. The de facto leader of this band of would-be heroes, Tannis Half-Elven, beleaguered and beset by doubt, turns to the cynical and much maligned mage Raceland Majir for advice. Raceland's critical of the bumbling and fumbling and the lack of direction, and to be honest, much of the detail of the conversation has been lost to my memory, as I had read the book many, many years ago. But one thing stuck. Raceland said the following to Tannis, Hope is the denial of reality. It is the carrot dangled before the draft horse to keep him plodding along in a vain attempt to reach it. To which Tannis replies, Are you saying we shouldn't hope? And Raceland rather wisely replies, I'm saying we should remove the carrot and walk forward with our eyes open. As a child, there was something always strangely appealing about Raceland and his mannerisms, and this statement even more so, because it remained forever lodged in my mind for decades after the fact. Uh, but as a child, I didn't quite understand the intent behind it. Only years later was it clear what Raceland sought to convey. Hope with no understanding racks the mind and body, driving it into the grave, and perhaps more importantly, it leads nowhere, and is little more than faith. Faith in a bright new day, faith in a god, faith in a slogan or euphemism or ideology, but ultimately amounts to nothing. Hope to the extent that it is proffered at all can only have value when accompanied by the tools that allow for the implementation of the things hoped for. All else is blind folly and the fool's errand. Much as Tannis and Raceland struggle in their war, so too do we struggle in ours. It is a war against ourselves a war of conflicting interest and internal confusion, a war forged by millions of years of evolution and instinct, battles of cognitive dissonance and emotion-driven denial, and we will surely lose it if we fight it with vain gestures, euphemisms, and appeals to emotion. We can win it, the chances are small, incredibly so, but it is possible, yet we cannot do it in denial and ignorance. We must remove the carrot. Thanks for watching.